Alrighty, can everybody hear me okay? Let's, um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm really excited about today's event. Let me first start off with our, um, our, our sponsors of this event, Benson Management. This is the Benson Management First Friday Lecture Series. Um, and Benson Management, as many of you know, is a family-owned business with 40 years of experience operating and managing a variety of real estate uh, housing uh, for students and residential and commercial properties in the La Crosse area. Um, they own properties that they manage. They providing exceptional maintenance to protect and enhance their investments. And they combine their experience in personal service and the latest technology to streamline the rental process. You can search through all their vacancies uh, or search specific categories to find the space that's right for you. So we're very appreciative of Benson Management for, for making this uh, possible. Um, there's also, uh, after this event, many of you know or should, should know that at, um, that at 4.30 when we finish, we'll go over to Wittick in the second floor where we'll have uh, a networking reception We'll have drinks, snacks, and, and other things for um, you to have. And that is sponsored by Grande Cheese. Grande Cheese is located in southeastern Wisconsin. And they serve as the premier manufacturer of fine Italian cheeses since the company began in 1941. They make great pizza cutters, too, and we'll have some of those uh, hopefully uh, there for you as well. Grande is deeply committed to their four pillars of social responsibility, business sustainability, environment, uh, environment associates, and community. And as identified in the company's culture statement, through these commitments and others, Grande continues its journey and ultimate quest to fulfill a, a greater purpose than, their, than themselves. They're also a great partner with UWL. Um, the chief executive officer, Todd Cost, is, a, of course, an alum, and, uh, and they support our students through scholarships and internships. So uh, we thank Grande Cheese as well. So it's my pleasure then to introduce our, our, um, our guest speaker today, Jeff Taxtall from ThreadLogic. Jeff was a, a, a marketing graduate of UWL. And he's going to spend time talking about his journey, so I won't go into too much of it, but I will say that um, um, uh, the following sort of, sometimes the journey is more important than the destination. Jeff Taxa, along with his wife, Wenda, are partners in the e-commerce company ThreadLogic, a company they started from scratch in their basement 20 years ago. Um, but Jeff's career decisions before ThreadLogic took an unconventional path. How did he make those career decisions? What did he learn about himself along the way that contributed to his success as an entrepreneur and business owner? Explore his journey with this first Friday presentation. Spoiler alert, not all your career decisions will be yours to make. Um, so with that, I want to welcome Jeff to the podium. Mary, are we good? All right. So there's another great thing that Jeff did, besides bringing hats and other things that he will, I think, um, what I used to do is use in the classroom Tootsie Rolls, and I would ask a question, and if someone got it right, I would throw it at them. That I think you have something like that with, with hats that you've made. So swag as they call it in the business, isn't it? We'll talk about it later, yes. Okay. Um, but there's something else that Jeff has done. As an alum, he understands the challenges that students face, and I, um, he offered to provide one student in the room today a $500 scholarship, which I think is fantastic. Um, yeah, that's great. So if you would take, um, is it under the seat or under the table? So if you take the table next to you and flip it up, Feel for, uh, um, the faculty are not eligible, just so you know. Like, I see you guys all looking. It's a bright yellow. Bright Give yellow. Yeah. All right, so down here. This is why you don't sit in the back row, right? Like, this is. Uh, all right, so, so afterwards, if you would, afterwards, if you'd come on up and we'll, we'll get everything we need to get and get those details. But I hope that you learned that lesson, those of you sitting in the back that came in first, <laughs> that sometimes it pays to sit in the front. Um, anyhow, thank you, Jeff, for that. And I will, uh, with that, turn it over to Jeff. I think he said that he's going to give his presentation. Normally, we hold questions till the end, but he said he's really comfortable if you want to fire questions at him. Because this is being recorded as well, um, we might need uh, Jeff to repeat the question or, or, or someone to repeat the question so that it, it's on the recording as well. So thanks. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Um, in case you didn't know this, Dr. Brooks just accepted a new position as Dean of the College of Business. Uh, give him a hand for that. That's pretty exciting. Can you hear me OK in the cheap seats? Good. Um, I really appreciate, thank you for coming out today. I really appreciate it. I hope this doesn't mess up the camera because I like to walk around a lot. Um, I appreciate you coming out today and spending a Friday afternoon with me. I realize that a Friday in April offers a lot of tantalizing opportunities for college students. So 
so I'm happy that you're here today spending it uh, with me. Also want to thank Dr. Brooks and the CBA, uh, the Alumni Association, and uh, the sponsors for the invitation today. I've been looking forward to doing this um, for a long time, ever since it kind of came up. So it's, it's a lot of fun to be here and be with you. Um, hopefully I can get the slides right and this thing right. Uh, I do want to, you're gonna get the most out of this if it's a two-way conversation. Right? So that means I want you to ask me questions. And again, as an incentive to that, I made some trucker hats this is what my company does. So if you ask a question and want a hat, you can take one home with you. If you don't want a hat, just say, no, thank you. That's ugly. Okay. Um, I am a UWL alum, class of 1986. I realize that for 90% of you in the room today, 1986 feels like a long time ago. Trust me when I tell you, it feels like a long time ago for me too. But I too was once your age. So I've been there a little bit. Um, at the risk of some great personal embarrassment, I want to show you just a couple of pictures of my time at UWL. Yeah, you can laugh. I won't be offended. That's fine. I was an RA for two years here on campus, my sophomore year at Lauks Hall and my junior year in Sanford Hall. And this is a picture of the Lauks Hall staff. This was Christmas time, 1983. We were getting ready to go to a holiday party. And just a couple of interesting facts about this. The gentleman up in the right-hand corner, in the upper right-hand corner with the cheesy mustache, is Harry Blount. And Harry actually was the initial first Friday speaker when this series started, I think about six years ago. And Tom Wargalit, who's in the middle there with the red tie, he did this uh, lecture a couple years ago as well. I'm the one down in the lower left with a lot more hair and a lot fewer pounds. <laughs> I did get an opportunity to leave a permanent image on campus. This is a mural I painted in the basement of Lauks Hall in 1984. It's a picture of Albert Einstein, which at some point got covered up by a TV. <laughs> I, I don't know why, but it's still, is it still there? Does anybody know if it's still in the basement of Sanford? I took this picture about six years ago when I was on campus, and it says imagination is more important than knowledge. But um, I'm actually, frankly, amazed it didn't get printed over decades ago. So that's pretty cool. Um, as Dr. Brooks said, my wife and I own an e-commerce company called Fred Logic. We make custom embroidered apparel for companies and organizations all across the country. And as he said, we literally started it in the basement of our house 20 years ago after I got laid off from my last real job. That story will come later. Um, just to give you a quick idea, this is kind of what we do. We embroider logos like this and put them on hats and bags and shirts and jackets for, again, companies and organizations all, all over the country. We started in our basement. We were there for three years, and we've moved twice, and we currently operate in a space of 11,000 square feet, which is probably about twice the size of this auditorium. We have 25 employees, and this year we'll ship about 200,000 pieces to companies all over the country. 90% of what we create leaves the state of Minnesota. I don't think I mentioned this, we're located in Minneapolis area. So 90% of what we do goes to another state. Um, California, Texas, Florida, New York, Illinois, are kind of our top five states that we ship to. And that makes sense, they're all population centers. This is my beautiful wife and I. This is a picture that we use on our website. If you go onto our website on the About Us page, uh, this is the picture we use. One of the really important lessons I learned early on when doing e-commerce is People don't buy from websites, people buy from people. So it's always been really important for me to show the people behind the company on our, on our website. 
There is a whole presentation I could do today about business startups and entrepreneurship and the importance of small businesses in our economy on the challenges of your spouse also being your business partner. By the way, we just celebrate our 30th anniversary. But we're not going to go <laughs> um, we're not going to go down that road today. How many of you here, just quickly, uh, come from a family that owns a business, or you have a small business in your family? Maybe even a farm, which is a business. That's fabulous. You guys have got great experience, and I hope you're utilizing that. So the title of the presentation is, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. This is a quote from Yogi Berra. And Yogi Berra is a baseball Hall of Famer who played in the 50s and the 60s, and I think managed in the 60s and into the 70s. And he, if you ever go onto the Google, you need to smile, you go onto the Google and search Yogi Berra quotes, you'll come up with just some fantastic quotes from him. Many people think they're nonsensical, and when you first read them, they kind of are. But what you discover later is there's a lot of wisdom there. This is one of them. One of my other favorite quotes of his is, baseball is 90% mental, the other half is physical. Not everybody got that. <laughs> so that's fine. Um, so we started the company when I was 37 years old. And I've often said that had, if we had started it when I was 27, it would have failed. And it would have failed because I just didn't have the experience I was going to gain in those 15 years after I graduated from UWL to the time we started the company. I didn't have that foundation of knowledge. 50% of startups won't make it to their fifth anniversary. A third won't make it to 10 years. So the fact that we've made it to 20 years is, is something we're pretty proud of. Hello. So this really today is a story about how I got to that point. The career decisions I made along the way, the pros and the cons, what did I learn from that experience, and what did I learn about myself through that process? I'm not going to take you through each one of those decisions. I changed jobs about eight times in that 15-year uh, period, just only the most important and impactful ones. Everyone approaches that kind of career planning differently. And there's a, even a lot of professionals that will help you plan your career. In fact, this is a model that many will often take you through. You'll, you'll set some goals and you'll write a plan. You'll have action items and they'll all be measurable. You guys have all seen this, right? I didn't do this. I didn't have a plan when I graduated. I didn't know what kind of industry I wanted to work for. I didn't know what kind of job I wanted to have. But what I did know is I thought, you know, I'm just going to find something and see where it takes me. And as I've gotten older, I figured out that's the way I do a lot of things, much to the chagrin of my wife business partner sometimes. But it's worked for me. And that's one of the message that one of the messages I want to deliver to you today is there's nothing wrong with this. There's a lot of really successful people that do this. But there's also some successful people who just go with the flow and see where those things take them. So your challenge is to figure out what you want to do, what you're good at, and what you're most comfortable doing. Any questions yet? Good. Um, one of the first jobs I had was for State Farm. Fabulous, big corporation. And at the time, my father was a State Farm agent and had been for 34 years, and my sister was a relatively new agent. So it was pretty easy for me to get in and get an interview, and I got a position in the entry as an entry-level operations person. Pretty quickly, within a couple of years of working there, I started to figure out a big corporation setting might not be the right fit for me. 
Um, there's a lot of things that go into uh, big corporations and working for one. One of them is company politics that you have to play, and I wasn't really good at that. In addition, uh, at the time, State Farm was very top heavy with white males in manager and leadership roles. And in case you haven't noticed, white male. And so it was going to be harder for me to get promoted. Now, they needed really badly to promote women and minorities. And that was absolutely the right thing for them to do at the time. And I have a lot of friends who uh, stayed on and worked there and had very successful careers there. But again, it just wasn't going to be an opportunity I felt I was going to have long-term success in. So one day a friend of mine came to me and said, hey, I know this company, they're, they're a consulting firm, and they're looking for somebody, and you might make a good fit. Are you interested? I said, sure. Why not? I'll talk to anybody, right? There's no job offer yet. Well, pretty soon there was a job offer. And I really had to weigh kind of the pros and cons of, of leaving a company like State Farm. And so one of the pros was more money. Money talks, right? One of the pros was this new consulting firm. I was going to be able to travel. In fact, I was going to travel a lot, not internationally, but domestically. And the job really interested me. I was going to have an impact on these companies I was going to work for. The cons were un insecurity and job security. A lot of the friends that I met when I worked there had very successful careers and still work there, many of them. The other thing is I didn't want to disappoint my parents because they were really excited and really happy when I went to work for State Farm. After all, it was a company they knew really well, and it was a company that had been very good to them. So I'm weighing this decision, and I'm thinking about it a lot. And then one day, a, a thought came to me. And again, it's a baseball analogy. I'm a baseball fan. And I thought, you know, life has thrown me a curveball. It's not something I really expected. And I just feel like I got to take a swing. I might miss. I might hit a home run. But I don't know if I don't swing at it. So I left State Farm. What did I learn about myself? I learned that I wasn't afraid of the unknown. I learned that I wasn't afraid of a calculated risk. I learned that I wasn't afraid of making a bad decision. I also wanted more control over my career. Again, I don't, I don't want to speak badly of State Farm because it's a great company, but this is true in a lot of larger corporations. You don't always have control over your career path. There are a lot of factors and a lot of variables that can affect your career. And I wasn't necessarily comfortable with that. So I went to work for this company, this little development or this little consulting firm called Team Development Group. Um, I'd put their logo on the screen if they existed. They don't anymore. But what I will say is living out of airports and hotels, not as glamorous as I thought. Next slide. That's all I'll say about that. About that time, my brother-in-law reached out to me. And he owned a small community bank in rural Minnesota. And he wanted to open a new branch in the Twin Cities. And he needed some help doing that. He needed some help setting it up. He needed some marketing help. And he needed a personal banker. So he reached out to me, and I took the job. Because I was fascinated. Uh, kind of by small business. I worked for him for about five years. And I realized that in order for me to advance and make more money in the banking industry and just to be able to climb the ladder as a banker, I was going to need to become a commercial lender. 
lending to uh, companies and organizations. That generally means, I'm synthesizing it a lot, but it generally means studying financial statements and business plans. And if you saw my grades in finance and accounting, you'd know that probably wasn't something I was really good at. And it's something I knew I didn't want to do for the rest of my career. So it became pretty obvious to me that I was going to have to move on and, and find something else. I also had the desire to get back into a marketing role full time. I was just doing marketing part time for the bank. And I wanted to get back into a more full time marketing job. Did I miss a slide? I might have missed a slide. Sorry. So what did I learn? I learned a lot about starting and operating a small business. That's what a bank is, it's a small business. I learned a lot about the importance of relationships in business. And surprisingly, I learned a lot about marketing a small business. The president of the bank, who was my brother-in-law, was a very intuitive marketer. And he never had a degree in marketing, or I don't think probably even classes in marketing, but he knew how to do it. And it gave me, the five years I spent was a master's degree in marketing of a small company. And that's what I learned also about myself. I wanted to be back into a job where I could be passionate about it and interested in it. And I wanted, again, to have um, more control over my career. I really discovered in this role that I liked being part of the process of figuring out new products, figuring out what hours were we going to be open, taking care of customers, and all of that kind of stuff. I, I love taking a deep dive into that marketing kind of stuff. I'm going to skip this slide because when I was timing my presentation, it ran too long, and this isn't a very interesting story. So I went to work for an electric cooperative that was about five miles away from where we lived. And at this time, in about the mid-1990s, there was a lot of talk about the deregulation of the electric grid. So currently, utilities, uh, water companies, electric companies, their customers are defined by a geographical area that the government tells them they can operate within. And they can't go outside of that area to get new customers, and no one else can come in their area to get customers. So the deregulation of this was a big deal. And they were thinking that if this actually happened, they needed to be better at marketing. They needed to find somebody that could help them compete in an open market, whatever that meant in the deregulation process. So I went to work for them uh, in their marketing department. And it was really a challenging situation they'd never before had to compete for a customer. And so they really didn't know how to do it. They really didn't know what marketing was, or what it could do for them, or how much it cost. It was an industry that was run by engineers and accountants. And every time I wanted to do something as a marketer, for those marketing students, you all know that stuff you want to do costs money, right? Every time I wanted to do something, I had to justify it. I had to show the ROI, the return on investment. And in the mid-1990s, that was really difficult to do. It's a little bit easier now on the internet with analytics and everything, but at that time, it was really hard to do. So it was a really frustrating situation for me. After a couple of years, I figured out deregulation wasn't going to happen and that their need for someone like me wasn't going to be that great. And again, it was going to be time to move on. Um, but what did I learn? I learned that I had put myself in that situation. I probably should have done more research about the culture and the organization before jumping into that. I wanted to work in partnership 
with leadership, and I felt like I was always battling against leadership, kind of banging my head against the wall. Culture and history of an organization matter. And so if you have an opportunity, if you're looking at companies as you're graduating, if you have an opportunity to learn anything about their culture, that will be very valuable for you in that decision making process. So I went to this company called Sagebrush Corporation. I was hired as their corporate communications manager. Typically, when you're at your first day on the job, you're spending some time setting up your computer, setting up your email, getting to know your coworkers, figuring out where the bathroom is, really mundane stuff like that. I experienced all of that on my first day and a little bit more. At about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, my boss came to my office and she brought me into a meeting of their senior leadership team. And I found out that the board of directors had just fired the CEO that hired me. And they wanted me to formulate a plan to communicate that news to the employees, their customers, and the industry. Welcome to your first day. It should have been a sign. It might have been a sign, and I didn't read it. I missed it. But it should have been a sign that something was going to change within that organization. Because it generally always does when you have a leadership change like that. And it certainly did in this case. Four months later, they went through a round of layoffs, and they laid off 40 people. I was one of them. Needless to say, scared the bejesus out of me. My wife and I had two young children, a relatively new mortgage, and I had no more paycheck. I'd never been in that situation. I'd never been fired. I'd never been laid off. But what did I learn? Oh, what did I learn is up there. What did I learn? As Dr. Brooks mentioned, you don't always have control over your employment status. I have no idea of why they chose to lay me off. I don't think it was because of my performance, because I really didn't have an opportunity in four months to show them what I could do or couldn't do. They, for some reason, decided that they needed to reduce their headcount, and I was ahead. So that was one lesson. The other lesson is what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. And I had heard someone say that right around the time this happened, and it kind of occurred to me, you know what, this is a bad thing, but I'm not dead. And I think in the long term, I'm going to be better off. So I spent the next year looking for a job. And I was doing some freelance work and some consulting work with some small companies. And that's kind of when it occurred to me that I should start my own company. And that's when we started ThreadLogic. It's the best career decision I didn't make. I wouldn't have had the guts to quit a job that was paying me a salary every two weeks to start something there was no guarantee of success and I didn't know how long it was going to take me to get back to earning money to the point where I was making on that last job. But I looked at it as taking a bet on myself. As I said, while I was looking for a job and doing some things, I was working with some small companies and doing some marketing consulting for them. And what I figured out was some of these small companies didn't do what I told them they should be doing. They, I would do some marketing plans for them, but they wouldn't implement them. They wouldn't execute on them. And I couldn't figure out why. But I thought, Jeff, if you're so damn smart, if you're as good as you think you are, why don't you do this for yourself? 
and then that's where we started this. Very few of you in the room will have a career path that looks like this, a straight line from where you are to where you might want to be. Yeah, there might be some hills and valleys, but that's pretty rare. Most of you will have a career path that looks like this. I see some, old, some older people nodding their heads. I was going to say oldsters, but that might not be the right thing to say because I'm an oldster. So why is that? Life happens. Spouses happen. Children happen. Pandemics happen. Dictators invade their neighbors. That happens. And that all of that has an effect and can have an effect on the career decisions you make and on your career path. The pandemic, I, I wish on some level I was going to be alive 75 years from now because I would love to read the history that will be written about this pandemic at that time. And I think it's been an incredible opportunity for your generation. And whether you know it or not, it has affected deeply your generation. But one of the things I love about the message that the pandemic has sent to your generation is this idea that we don't control everything. As humans, we tend to think we can control everything. Well, we know now we don't. And things can change very quickly. When you think about, we first heard about COVID in December of 19 or early 20, or early January of 2020. And by March, April, the economy was stopped. Less than 90 days later, things just changed. It was amazing to watch that but it's taught all of you how to pivot and survive in something that you couldn't control. And that has just been an invaluable lesson. We have two children that are about your age. They're 23 and 21, and I look at them and I'm like, you guys are so lucky for having been through this. Yes, it sucks. It's ter I hate Zoom. Thank goodness I don't have to do it very much, but I can't stand it. But all of that has taught us as a culture and as a society, some really important lessons. Here's the other thing that I think is really important to remember. Chances are really good that the industry you work in, the company you work for, and the job you have probably doesn't exist today. Think about that for a second. I'm going to sound like an old man here. When I was your age, none of these companies existed. And we think, you know, Amazon and YouTube and Google have been around forever. They haven't. And these kind of marketing jobs, SEO, e-commerce, content marketing, those jobs didn't exist either. So how do you prepare for that? My answer to that question is pretty lame but it's something I think the professors in the room will probably appreciate. And that is you just have to never stop learning. Never stop being curious. Always try to improve yourself. And if you do that, you'll be able to pivot and you'll be able to survive when things outside of your control happen. So I wanna close with two of my favorite sayings that have helped me a lot in my personal life and my professional life. The first one is if you're not failing, you're not doing anything. Failure is such an important component of success. There is no success without failure. Real learning only happens when you fail. It's, it's unfortunate our culture doesn't celebrate failure for the gift that I think it really is. Too often we look at failure as a negative, but failure is really a gift. So own it, embrace it, benefit from it. This is the other one. 
Never change, never improve, never adapt, and die naked, cold, and alone. I wish I had that movie trailer voice, and I could say this. Never change, never improve, never adapt. It's really a dark sentiment, right? It's pretty dark. It's not uplifting and positive, but it's really true. Again, you can Google companies that don't exist anymore, and you will see a long list of really great companies that didn't change, they didn't improve, and they didn't adapt. And they no longer exist. Again, this is one of my other favorite sayings. If you come to a fork in the road, take it. Don't stop. Don't turn around and go back. Pick a direction and go. It's about the journey, not the destination. The destination for me doesn't happen without the journey that I took. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. We've got some hats and they need homes. <laughs> Questions? Nobody was brave enough to ask one during the presentation. They were either sleeping or... They were awake. I highly them. involved. I heard them breathing. <laughs> Did you hear that? She asked how, how it kind of chose to, to start that kind of company. It's, a, it's an interesting story. Um, in many of the roles I had as a, as a marketer, that's how I knew about it, and I knew how it existed. At one point, I worked for this company, and we needed some shirts for an event. <clears throat> and I went to a local company and uh, had them make up the shirts. And I went to pick them up the day before I event before the event, and they were wrong. They had done it wrong, and I was kind of stuck because I needed something for my event. And I'll never forget, I'm walking out the door with one of my coworkers, and I said, if I had to compete with them, I could kick their butt. <laughs> and it was kind of that. The other thing is um, my wife is one of these women who made her prom dress in high school, right? She did the 4-H sewing projects. So she knew all about needle, bobbin, and thread. And so it seemed like a good fit for what we did. I knew it was the right thing at one point when I was, I was out visiting um, a machine salesman who sold the embroidery machines. And he quite literally said to me, I can teach a monkey how to run this machine. The hard part is running the business and marketing the business. And I was like, okay, that's supposed to be what I know how to do. I think we can make this work. It's been, it's so much fun. Now, very quick story. Um, I told these guys uh, earlier when I was meeting with them. This past summer, we did an order for the vice president's residential staff. It had the vice president, yeah, that vice president, right? Kamala Harris, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Her residential staff ordered some polos from us, and we embroidered the vice presidential seal. That's the power of the Google. They don't know. I mean, they're in Washington, right? They have no idea. They don't know anything about Thread Logic in Jordan, Minnesota, but they found us on the Google. Would you like a hat? Yes, she would. <laughs> she would. Says her boss. Yes, he does. <laughs> yes, sir. How did you get yourself out there with all these like big companies? Yeah. Um, so he asked, how how did I put how did I get ourselves out there and compete with um, a lot of other bigger companies? It's a good question. We started very small, and I did not start with an e-commerce model in mind. I was just going to work with the local community and the local businesses. And three or four years into uh, my business, my brother said to me one day, and he worked at Cargill at the time, and he said, you should look at this internet thing. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> um, 
What year was this? Can we give the, give the students a concept uh, of the year? 2005. Okay. Because my perception was being on the internet meant being a transactional company, and it was all about who had the lowest price. And that's not the kind of business I wanted to have. But I thought, you know what, if I really want to scale this, this is what we're going to have to do. And so we started very small. Um, we started advertising on Yahoo. I, I didn't even want to touch Google at the time. I was afraid of Google. So we started on Yahoo and just advertised um, on that. And I compete right now with companies that are multiple times bigger than me. In fact, we get a lot of customers from Land's End. Yeah, I know I'm in Wisconsin. We get a lot of customers from Land's End, and I think it's because we have a broader product offering and better service. And we've just been building ever since. Would you like a hat? Yeah, I'll deliver. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she's asking about, you know, kind of moving and changing jobs. How did that affect family and, and living situations and all of that? Um, fortunately, all the jobs I had were in the area where we lived. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't really a, a problem for us. But the job I skipped over, because I said the story wasn't very interesting, that was a company that was in downtown Minneapolis. And my commute door to door was an hour, one way. And so that meant I spent two hours every day commuting. And if it snowed, that turned to three hours or four hours. And, and with a young family, it was like, nope, I can't do it. I'm not going to spend the time in the car or on the bus and not be with my kids. Yes, ma'am. Did I have any mentors? Um, through my career, I would say no. And I would say I wish I had. After I started my, my business, my brother-in-law was kind of one of my mentors. And, and he helped me out a lot. Since then, about 10 years ago, I joined a peer group. And it's a group of other business owners. There's about 15 of us, and we meet once a month. And we so help each other solve our problems because we all have the same problems, right? It's marketing, it's people, it's money. No matter what industry we're in, we all have very similar problems. So that has been invaluable. But I did not have a mentor, and I wish I would have. Yes, ma'am. Wow. Uh, she asked if I were to go back to my 37-year-old self, what piece of advice would I give to myself? <laughs> I, I honestly don't know how to answer that. I mean, it's a great question. I wish I would have thought about it so I could have prepared a better answer. Um, I think one of the mistakes I made then is I didn't price my product properly. I was concerned that so much uh, in our industry, it's all about price. And I was concerned and afraid of pricing my product too high and pricing myself out of the market. And I didn't need to worry about that. But that's really specific. And I'm, I'd, I'd like a, a bigger, broader answer, but I'm Come to the reception later, and I'll have come up with something. But it's a, that's an outstanding question. Thank you. Yes, sir. One challenge working <laughs> with your spouse. Anybody in here who's married want to answer that question? Uh, you do not get to answer. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I've only be recently been able to appreciate how unique this situation is. We've had so many friends tell us, God, I could never work with my wife, or I could never work with my husband, or whatever. 
And I'm like, yeah, that's just what we do. Um, one reason I think it works for us is we have complementary skill sets. We're not different people, but we're also not the same person. And how I very generally define what we do in the company is it's my job to bring the orders in, and it's her job to make sure they get out. And we kind of stay in our lane. I know what she's really good at, so I don't try and tell her how to do her job, and vice versa. That's worked for us. Anybody want to share their experience working with their spouse? Any? <laughs> I'll pass. I, I, won't, uh, I won't pretend that it's easy. We will talk about, we'll be driving to Christmas to our family, and we'll be talking about the business. Um, one of the things I didn't realize, young lady, with the great question, um, owning a business is a lifestyle. It's not a nine to five job. It's 24 seven, 365, and I didn't realize that when I started. And what made me realize that is my wife came from a farming family. They were farmers, and you know that's the best example. That's a lifestyle. You're always working on it. And so owning a business is that way. You're always working on it. It's been hard for us to sometimes separate, maybe. Well, here's a good example. <laughs> I hope my wife's not watching. There's often times, you know, it comes to the weekend, it's like, hey, honey, let's go out to dinner. She's like, I don't want to go to dinner with you. I just spent the whole week with you. <laughs> I want to go out with my friends. Okay, I get that. But that's one of the challenges. <laughs> There's lots of chuckling going on over here in the faculty section. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, lots of hands. Yes, ma'am. So she was asking if I had a lot of people that doubted me or doubted us, yeah. um, or if there was a lot of support. If anybody doubted us, I don't think they ever expressed it. Um, there was a lot of doubt myself at times. There was a lot of times I thought, God, is this really going to work? But I, I never heard anybody say, oh, no, don't do this. You don't know what you're doing or anything like that. And so maybe that's the Midwestern culture is where we don't share that kind of thing. But, yeah, no, I don't ever remember, remember that. It's a good question.